Hello and welcome to Brain on Fire webinar. Uh, my name is Caleb Rudd and joining us today is Dr. Sandeep Gupta and Dr. Mary Ackley. Thank you, Caleb. I'm really, really excited about this webinar because, you know, we've really been working with people with uh, CIRS or mold illness um, for many years, both Dr. Ackley and myself. And one of the really, really huge problems that people encounter with this condition is, is relating to the brain. And that includes things like brain fog, which, which means people's memory isn't working properly, people's ability to assimilate information is not working properly, they can't concentrate. And um, it's, it's also extremely common to get anxiety and depression and uh, hopelessness and, and, and a variety of other conditions pertaining to the brain. So today we're going to explore how this condition of CIRS affects the brain and how, how we can understand the mechanism whereby CIRS affects the brain and then also talk about what can be done about it so that we can actually fully regain our brain's abilities and also recover from any mood disorders or any other psychiatric symptoms uh, that, that patients could be suffering from. Anything you'd like to, to start off with, um, Dr. Ackley, about your experience uh, with this condition? Um, my experience um, comes from being a psychiatrist who started to see patients who said they had mold. And as I've said before, I simply assumed it was psychosomatic as I was taught and there was a mold doctor f practicing fairly near me and people would come to see me because they were still depressed and anxious and needed treatment um, and didn't want to go on medications and at some point I began to realize that mold illness was not just psychosomatic in the head but that was you know verifiable with labs and a reality and you could you know measure mold and I became, I guess, a SIRS doctor. And so my experience has always been in treating people with really um, psychiatric and neurological and psychiatric problems, because even in the beginning, I was seeing people who were afraid they were getting Alzheimer's. And so um, over the years, I've seen a broader variety of patients, but the mainstay um, of what I see are people whose primary complaints are my brain doesn't work, I'm depressed all the time, I'm so anxious, I can't sleep, I can't think about anything, and I don't even know what to do. Um, and, and those encompass actually many of the symptoms of SIRS too. Um, and so working with you know psychiatric, neurological, psychiatric problems has been something I've become more skilled at and knowledgeable about. Great, thank you for that intro. We look forward to uh, exploring that more in this call today. Uh, so could we have the slide deck back on? And uh, next slide, thanks. Okay, next slide, thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. So there's gonna be a fair bit of information we're gonna be covering in this webinar today. So to get the most out of this webinar, uh, I'm gonna suggest that you might care to close or minimize other web pages and browser tabs and have a pen and paper ready uh, because there will be some new concepts discussed although there's nothing totally new there will be some information you may not have have encountered today and therefore it will be worth um, noting down any new information thank you okay a little bit about myself many of you who have had a look at the mold has made simple course or who live in Australia uh, will know me. Um, I graduated here in Australia uh, from the University of Queensland in 1999 and my original training was in, in intensive care uh, in, in the hospitals in Brisbane and particularly I used to look after patients um, who had had heart surgery or cardiac surgery and, um, and were suffering from a variety of problems after cardiac surgery but I also looked after patients who had something called sepsis and uh, we may get a bit of time to talk a little bit about how the condition of sepsis actually has acted as a prototype condition for the discovery of CIRS or mold illness. Um, I've now been on the Sunshine Coast for around seven years actually, but and with my own uh, private holistic medicine or integrative medicine practice. And um, 
I had a, a little bit of a personal journey with mold as well, with a house that flooded on the Sunshine Coast. And uh, that led me to seek out Dr. Richie Shoemaker and become uh, the first non-US doctor to become certified in, in the Shoemaker Protocol. And uh, I was lucky enough to co-author uh, the consensus statement on, on chronic inflammatory response syndrome with Dr. Ackley, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Rappaport, Dr. McMahon, and Dr. Shoemaker. Thank you, Caleb. Uh, Dr. Ackley, would you like to, to um, introduce yourself? Um, yes. Um, so I am a classically trained psychiatrist and um, board certified um, integrative physician also and my practice is my passion for health and I've um, been the co-author on the same consensus statement and more recently um, have been involved with a paper on VIP um, and neuroquants showing that VIP um, was safe and was effective somewhat in, in restoring and in helping some of the atrophy that we see. Um, I've also been involved with inhalational Alzheimer's too with Dr. Bredesen and wrote an article which has gotten a lot of play on Brain on Fire, which is um, my, my words basically on um, the psychiatric symptoms that mold seems to cause and cause pretty quickly. Right, and Dr. Bredesen's work is really quite fascinating, isn't it? Looking at um, the role of um, uh, of chronic inflammatory response in Alzheimer's disease, and and how how VIP particularly appears to to have a very promising role in reversing that, and that that's very exciting, I think. Exciting and frightening when you consider how common neuroinflammation is, if it really is the predecessor. Uh, for some people, at least, to Alzheimer's, I know I get an increasing number of inquiries from boomers who are, you know, getting to the age where they're thinking about Alzheimer's and really wondering, um, does my brain look like Alzheimer's? Do I have mold? Is there something I can treat so I don't get Alzheimer's? I think it's probably the most feared illness there is as you get older. Okay, so a little bit for those who are fairly new to this condition and... and uh, for those who know quite a bit about this condition, this is going to be old hat, so just bear with us. But basically, mold illness is a colloquial term for what's actually known as chronic inflammatory response syndrome due to the indoor environment of water damaged buildings. Try saying that three times fast. <laughs> it is abbreviated as CIRS WDB, and commonly we just refer to it as CIRS. This condition has been discovered and named by Dr. Richie Shoemaker, who you see pictured on the right side of this slide here, who both Dr. Ackley and I have trained under. Uh, Dr. Shoemaker and his CIRS certified physicians, of, of which there's about 15, I believe, have co-authored dozens of peer-reviewed papers, um, which are in reasonably reputable journals as well. I mean, they're not the main journals like New England Journal of Medicine, but the 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 reasonable journals, and he has a whole collection of articles at uh, survivingmold.com. Thanks, Caleb. So, what happens to the brain in CIRS? Um, and I think we can start before we start asking Dr. Le Ackley questions. I'm just going to give a very brief overview to make it simpler for you. And I want to introduce two terms, and they are edema and atrophy. So the simple thing is to, to change the word in your edema in your mind to swelling. Many of you may have heard of the term edema when it relates to your ankles. When you, for instance, uh, go on a long plane flight and, uh, and you're swollen in the ankles, um, medically we call that ankle edema. Now the same thing happens in certain areas of your brain due to CIRS. Now, it's particularly the front area of the brain, um, the forebrain, parenchyma, um, it's called, and there's, there's a number of other areas. They become swollen due to inflammation. Now, inflammation is a silent fire that occurs in your body. And the reason that we get inflammation in this condition of CIRS is because 
people with CRS are not able to properly process mold toxins. And therefore, instead of creating a proper immune response, they develop a inflammatory, a chronic inflammatory response, which means they develop, develop a silent fire in their body. And that silent fire particularly affects the brain. So if you have a look at the diagram on the left side of this slide, that's a very good way of visualizing this, um, that the brain actually goes on fire. And then that was the name of Dr. Ackley's article, The Brain on Fire. So that's what we're talking about in this condition of CIRS, is that we have inflammation actually physically affecting the brain. It's not just in your, well, it is in your head, but it's actually, there are actually measurable changes. Um, and we also get atrophy or shrinkage. Uh, and, um, and there's very, various other conditions in which we use the word atrophy in medicine. Um, but really it always means shrinkage. And as you see on the right side of this slide, these bushes are becoming um, progressively more shrunken. And there are certain areas that get shrunken in CRS, and it's particularly an area called the caudate nucleus, um, which gets, gets shrunken in CRS. And um, that's another result of the inflammation that's occurring in the brain. Uh, Dr. Ackley, would you like to add anything to that? Or... Um, the atrophy um, and the swelling combined to make um, what we commonly refer to as mold brain, which is uh, cognitive impairments in focus, in memory, in short-term memory, uh, the inability to assimilate new information, which is one reason this course was developed, so that people can go at their own pace and repeat um, these concepts again and again until they become as familiar um, to the patient as they are to the doctor who is kind of rattling them off needing to get through a full hour of treatments too. So um, that's where it may be very familiar to people is in the assimilation of lots of new information quickly is very difficult with the kind of atrophy and swelling we see. And the swelling in particular affects the frontal lobes which is um, you can uh, realize by their name, they're very close to the nose um, and inhalation are gonna, is going to occur through the nose. So because the blood-brain barrier is most likely, I think the best word really is leaky, that you can understand, it's hyperpermeable. Um, it leads to this microvascular cerebral edema seen usually only with neuroquant, not, um, not on just the normal scan read by the radiologist. And it's that um, inflammation or swelling of the frontal lobes that leads to some of the executive functions being impaired and the executive in the brain focuses orga and organizes and that's something that can be really difficult for people um, certainly in the beginning stages of the illness it's also the emotional regulator of the brain so you have a limbic system generating a lot of emotions and impulses and it's the executive who listens to him and says stop you know we can think that but not say it because it's going to have consequences down the road if you tell your boss what you really think of them or tell your wife etc um and it's that lack of emotional regulation which can be seen as rage um or just irritability um that often characterizes some patients right so so if someone's suffering with this condition and they find that they're they're a bit more emotional than normal and they're, they're saying things to the, their partner, for instance, that they w usually wouldn't say and they're snapping at little things. Um, sounds like you're saying there's actually, there is actually a real physical cause for this. And, uh, yeah. and it's and important to remember that, that it, because there's going to be a lot of conflict usually in SIRS um, be, in a couple of terms of, you know, executing a plan to get out of water damage. and remembering that each side's responses in, in uh, this planning are not entirely rational um, is, is, is important to just have a lot more tolerance and even some laughter once in a while at what's going on. I know sometimes yeah. I will just burst out laughing at some of the arguments I see going on because I've seen them so many times and it's the same thing yeah, said back right. and forth 
and it's not going anywhere, it's not soluble, and it's usually regretted at some point afterwards. So I'll just sort of laugh and go, let's keep going. Okay, great. So do you think sometimes one strategy can be for for a, a patient with this condition to just to be able to name when they think they're becoming more emotional or they're, be, they're not acting in a characteristic way to say, oh, here's, here's my, my brain on fire again or here's my mold brain again. Absolutely. Hey, I'm oh. sorry when you come down. Hey, I'm sorry. I really didn't mean this, you know? Let's, let's take a time out, you know, that sort of thing. Let's go do something we like and not think about this for the rest of the night. Yeah, I think that's very helpful. So I think it's worth uh, noting that on this slide, around 13 to 19 of the main 36 symptoms, which make up the cluster table, which is part, is part of the way that we diagnose CIRS or SIRS, um, are neurological or brain related. So therefore, the brain is a very, very major component of this illness. Maybe roughly we could say half of the symptoms pertain to the brain. Anything you'd like to add to that, uh, Dr. Ackley? No, just to emphasize that if you just look at this um, based on um, physiological symptoms, you know, you have the psychiatric, the mood swings, and I, I'd like to point out anxiety is not there. But my experience, and in many physicians' experience, anxiety is one of the most prominent symptoms. And Dr. Shoemaker said once upon asking him, he said he just didn't know how to measure it because it was so subjective. So my opinion, anxiety should be part of this too, as well as mood swings. There's all the focus, decreased word finding, concentration problems, um, ability to assimilate new information. Those are the cognitive issues. And then there um, are the more neurologicals. Light sensitivity tends to be a real sis, um, symptom of neuroinflammation. And it's important to know that it's really, you see it even more in kids sometimes, is that sensitivity to sound, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to smell. Smell gets labeled as multiple chemical sensitivity. Other people's sounds, um, noises, and lights are worse. And it's neuroinflammation, it's a hallmark, and it's a good way to identify, oh, there's something going on. White lights really bother me now, or I just can't stand loud music. And I, the kids, you know, chattering or playing really gets on my nerves, et cetera. Um, and then we also just have, you know, vision is actually a neurological um, uh, uh, function. So that's the blurred vision and the visual contrast is when you fail it is a measure really more of neurological function, um, which I think has been covered here. There's, you know, the taste vertigo is another neurological symptom. And uh, the thermal regulation that's often seen, again, that's the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the increased urination and appetite swings. Um, and so that's the HPA. And probably if you're good, you could make a, you know, case that the brain is involved in everything, pain, headaches, um, too. So. Uh, the point of all of this is, is that the brain starts to get affected, and in my guess for many people it's what's first affected, and we, I think we're going to talk about that later when we talk about what happens to some people when they walk in water damaged buildings and how they can use that to turn around and walk out. Uh, so this uh, is the, um, uh, oh, we're getting no, some echo here. Yeah. Not sure what's not sure what's just uh, do, you, um, do you have another um, microphone or do you have another um, window open with the the actual live one? No, no. Let me just turn, try turning the microphone down a bit. Oh, here we go. Um, I'll just use my, my other microphone. That's better. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so in this slide we have a NeuroQuant result. Um, so many of you would know NeuroQuant is a FDA approved uh, program, or it's, a, it's really a computer program which interprets the brain areas of, or it, it interprets the brain volumes rather, of 11 different brain areas from a MRI brain scan and it provides a table of numbers like this, which um, most of the Shoemaker certified physicians uh, interpret through a little spreadsheet. 
and come up with a score for CIRS due to water damage buildings. And there are also some, some scoring uh, indices which may indicate that tick-borne diseases may be playing a factor as well. Um, but, but one of the big things is, is like, for instance, on this particular neuroquant, um, I'm sure Dr. Ackley will notice that chordate is quite severely shrunken. It's about an average of about 0.16. Which I put it, would you put that in the severe range, uh, Dr. Ackerley? Depending on the age, but yeah, it would certainly. Yeah, fairly severe. And so, what, yeah. what sort of symptoms would someone expect? And we, I think we're seeing a, a swollen forebrain and cortical gray here as well, which is classic of mold brain. Absolutely. And also, the cerebellum is a little bit on the larger size, something that interests yeah. me. Um, and the hippocampus is a nice size, though. That's not atrophied. So okay. the caudate is, is the most dopamine-rich part of the brain. And dopamine, as most people know, is our passion um, neurohormone it's, it's, or neurotransmitter. It it's, has to do with pleasure and reward. And so, obviously, if that starts getting smaller, um, there's going to be less ability for a person to experience pleasure in their life and reward, and one of the things most associated with caudate atrophy um, will be lack of motivation, because motivation is passion, and passion is pleasure, and you have to get excited about things to want to do things. And what you see, and what most people experience, is life has become somewhat gray, or, or a lot gray, and it's being run really more by what we call the amygdala, which deals with fear and survival and things you have to do. You have to pay your taxes. You have to pick up your kids. You have to do this. Um, it doesn't have a lot to do with getting up in the morning thinking, wow, I can't wait to write that book or I can't wait to go paint this painting. And most people just laugh at that thought because that left a long time ago. And so, um, you know, showing any restoration there is going to change the you know psychological experience of most people should also point out the basal ganglia uh, deficits in the basal ganglia are associated with parkinson's which is a disorder um, of decreased dopamine and slowed movement is probably one of the first things we notice in parkinson's and tremor and tremor can be seen fairly frequently um, in in mold and it's one of the things that brings people in too is I have a tremor. I'm really worried. Right. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation. And so that's a, it's a very interesting test, really, NeuroQuant, and it'll be interesting to see how the research on, on NeuroQuant develops over the next few years. Yeah, I should just point um, so, out that, yeah, just, I'm sorry to interrupt, is no, that right. NeuroQuant's being used in other fields. It was originally developed for Alzheimer's, and everyone who gets a NeuroQuant, you know, will get actually. Um, there is there is a uh, sheet that comes age related atrophy that shows no you don't have Alzheimer's just about everybody I've unfortunately seen a couple where Alzheimer's was was an issue um, but it's also being used in other fields a lot because the ability to measure the brain accurately much more accurately than humans can do is very important concept in psychiatry and in neurology. Um, in trying to figure out what is manic depressive illness, you know, what is Parkinson's, etc. Hmm. I think one thing that's worth addressing very quickly, actually, Caleb, if you don't mind just going back one slide, a lot of people, Dr. Ackley, who I speak to, when they see their neuroquant, it creates a fair bit of anxiety in them, in that the image of having a swole, uh, shrunken and swollen brain feels very scary to them and they, they wonder whether it's their brain is actually beyond repair. Would you mind just speaking about that really quickly as to whether the, 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 the changes in the brain are permanent or whether no. they can actually be totally reversed? No. Um, the swelling is something that seems to reverse faster in my experience when we do repetitive neuroquants um, in the papers that have come out that's something you see um, decrease faster and I like compare it to a computer the hardware is still all there it's just a little soggy and we're going to try and dry it out and that's a lot easier than replacing hardware that's not there um, you know there, there's still a motherboard there 
atrophy is a little different and VIP does seem to help restore growth in the gray matter, but gray matter atrophy is, you know, a pressing concern in most of neurology um, as being associated with neurodegenerative diseases. So that is a little bit more concerning to me than swelling. And people often, when you say the brain is swollen, will go, yes, I know it, I feel it, I can feel my head. It's like it just wants to pop out and I, I feel pressure and especially pressure in the back of the head and headaches there. And it's actually confirming to people is this is not in my mind, you know, this is in my brain, but it's a distinction between what's in your mind and what's in your brain. So there's a, a confirming um, part of seeing this too. And it's always relieving when you hear, no, you don't have Alzheimer's. In fact, you have okay. usually the opposite pattern of Alzheimer's. Great. That's very helpful. I also want to just very quickly mention the condition we call multinuclear atrophy. So some people have a neuroquant which has three or more areas which are atrophied or shrunken. And, and we often call that multinuclear atrophy. Uh, would you be able to just briefly talk about what that diagnosis means or what that term means and is there any differences in terms of whether people's brain can recover if they have multinuclear atrophy? I'm going to say we don't know the answer to the second part because multinuclear atrophy is also associated with aging and we're going to see more as people get older um, and it's not necessarily Alzheimer's either. Um, it, it does seem to be a factor in growing older. so. The recovery we did see in the hippocampus is one of the places that is, that's the one that's most associated with Alzheimer's when that is two standard deviations below um, the cutoffs of the means for the age and the ventricles are two standard deviations above. Uh, that's something we're, we're thinking about Alzheimer's and is pretty characteristic of Alzheimer's. And that one you can get better and everybody is looking for actual reversal of Alzheimer's. That would be um, probably one of the most sought after things for many people is again, you know, if I die of cancer, I die of a heart attack, I go. But if I'm, I'm sitting in a nursing home for years with my kids, you know, taking care of me or having my diapers changed, just please, you know, and I'll hear many different variations on that. You know, I don't want that to happen. Okay, great. And just very quickly on the subject of Lyme, actually this patient, it's interesting to note their right thalamus is actually getting right up there. And uh, which is the main, I believe that's the main area we look at for Lyme on the neuroquant. And so if someone does come up and there's some concern about the possibility of them having a Lyme-like illness, which is what we call it in Australia, um, how would you suggest that they proceed Okay. Um, I think right now the criteria is that right thalamus is 0.61 or greater. I actually saw one the other day in a person who had three bands positive on their IgM Western blot, and I said, I think those ticks did have Lyme that bit you, you know, and that was like, wow, I can feel comfortable. It is not a criteria for chronic Lyme. This was all done with acute Lyme, these numbers, so I can't really tell people, does this mean you have chronic Lyme? What I can say is, you know, your thalamus is really pretty normal sized here and it doesn't look like you have acute Lyme. Okay, so the so neuroquant may not be as helpful for distinguishing chronic Lyme from from mold. Is that is that what you're saying? It's helpful to me because I get to see a lot of people who've been treated for Lyme for several years. They're not getting better. They hear about mold and they come for a consult. And I'll point out in a brain like this is, wow, you have some market swelling here on the, you know, right frontal lobe. Um, and you have some real atrophy of the caudate and the cortical gray is swollen too. And this is, you know, we see this in mold. That's a fingerprint. You already have six out of eight here for SIRS. And I think it's certainly worth exploring the possibility that mold is either your main problem or keeping you from making progress in your Lyme treatment. Okay, great. So, yeah. So looking at the biomarkers and... Uh, uh, th these, are, these are markers that we commonly check in SERS patients or patients who we're assessing. Um, and um, it's a bit of an alphabet soup when you first get exposed to these terms, such as TGF-beta-1 and MMP-9 and C4A. 
Um, but you've just got to hang in there and learn to navigate the, uh, the alphabet soup. So these, basically what these markers are, uh, we call them um, proteins which fuel the fire of inflammation in the body, in, in our course. And what happens is that these proteins increase inflammation. Um, and sorry, backing up a second, the inf we get increased inflammation due to toxins into the water in water damaged buildings, which then causes interstitial edema and can also cause leaky brain. And um, that can eventually, um, I'm actually missing the last word here. Hang on just one second. Um, that can, uh, Caleb, can you just read what is the last word on this? Um, I think dropped off atrophy. If, I mean, eventually the inflammation uh, will cause the atrophy that you oh, causes atrophy. About. Okay, got you. And so the atrophy is, uh, as Dr. Ackley said, um, a, a more severe manifestation of uh, inflammation in the brain. Um, Dr. Ackley, anything you want to mention about these markers uh, specifically and how they actually affect the brain and, and contribute to the brain inflammation we see in SIRS? There are several things. TGF beta 1, by the way, is associated with Alzheimer's when they do spinal taps. Um, so, and we know it certainly is playing a role in, in atrophy in the brain. MMP9 uh, seems to cause more leakiness um, of the blood-brain barriers associated with headaches in the brain. And I'm going to say there's probably a lot more associations. They're just not as well researched in neurological and psychiatric literature as, say, other markers of inflammation. Um, C4A is very exciting to me. I think people have heard me talk about it before, but in psychiatry, we have symptoms that we call schizophrenia, or we call it bipolar, and we think we're separating people out by the symptoms, and then when we go to look at their brains and their um, physiology, they look wildly different, and our diagnostic categories don't seem to make much sense. So it's very exciting that finally they studied about 60,000 people, I think, and found a genetic marker for schizophrenia. It's a big deal um, that this is the first thing in uh, schizophrenia they found at the genetic level. And I was reading this in the New York Times last year, thinking, wow, they f we finally got something in psychiatry that looks like science, and they're calling it C4, it's complement 4, and I'm thinking, wait, complement C4, is it RC4A? It is. This is the association finally found in schizophrenia is a cytokine that we routinely measure in, um, in SIRS every day. It's an indicator that the innate immune system has, has um, been activated and about how much activation is going on. So what C4 does in the brain is something called pruning, and there was a slide a while back of, of a brain that was basically covered in shrubs, and you could see there was a little bit of pruning, and a little bit of pruning is necessary um, in any garden for things to grow. And it's the same with the brain, is that um, a little bit of pruning is associated with the cleaning up we do in sleep, for instance. Um, so we start with a fresh slate the next day. However, you don't want the slate too fresh. And when the gardener basically, you know, cuts away far more than they're supposed to and takes the shrubs down just to the woody branches saying, oh, you know, it's all going to grow back next spring. That's what's associated with schizophrenia is C4A actively prunes and over prunes in the brain. And there's some speculation that this is what's happening in schizophrenia. The gardener went, you know, I won't use the word mad, I guess, but the gardener has um, been overdone it and they've lost vital connections. The slates become too fresh. So um, it's to me incredibly exciting is that uh, there's an immunological basis linked to the inflammation we see every day and is incredibly common. And I'm going to make the point at the end of this how common this inflammation is that has been linked to schizophrenia and is the first thing in psychiatry really that starts to approach real science on the level of, say, where we see in cancer or cardiology. Okay, great. So it's a little bit of a, a scary analogy to think that a gardener may have come with the shears into your brain. Um, but 
uh, the good news yeah. it sounds like, Dr. Ackley, is that the, 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 the bushes can to some degree grow back if the gardener calms down a bit. Absolutely, and I, I make that point is I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't see people getting better. And you know why? Because there's neurology, it's very hard to see people get better from neurodegenerative diseases, psychiatry. They get better, but they're being treated for the rest of their lives with medications, and they don't really recover. I just thought when I found treating inflammation for psychiatric illnesses, people actually return to wholeness, I thought, wow, this is the best thing I've seen in this field. So that's why I'm here doing it. And that's why I want other people and other psychiatrists, neurologists to know about it. It's, it's, it's optimistic. Absolutely. Actually, if we could just go back one slide again, Kayla, please. Just wanted to say very quickly as well, um, Dr. Ackley, just so people have an idea of what levels of these uh, markers might be associated with brain changes, would you say just as a rough indication, maybe TGF beta 1 levels that are above 10,000 um, and C4A levels around, you know, that are above 10,000 and maybe MMP9 levels around somewhere above 500 are more likely to cause significant or do you use uh, significant brain symptoms, or would you use different figures? No, well, yeah, I, I see people with significant symptoms lower than that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, but yes, that would be significant, um, and, and certainly very easy to make a diagnosis with those symptoms. I do see that people whose numbers are pretty low still have significant symptoms, and sometimes I'm going a little bit on faith that the num you know, the numbers are low, but they are significantly impaired. Um, and I think there are other things related to people's vulnerabilities too that make lower numbers um, as dangerous as higher numbers in some people. Okay, well that's that's actually interesting because I um, sometimes what I had been telling people, or, or my understanding had been like, so for instance, if someone has had chronic Lyme disease and they've got, for instance, a TGF beta of only about 3,000 and a C4A of only about 3,000 and maybe the MMP9 is only 380, I would say to them, look, I think you do have SIRS going on, but if you're really, really unwell, um, these levels may not explain the severity of your symptoms and therefore you could have some ongoing infections. Do you agree with that thought process or not so Yeah, I, I'd say something similar is I'm a little puzzled because I do okay. think you have SIRS, but something I see, on, um, I've seen a fair amount really with people with lower levels is when you start binders, those numbers start coming up. It's almost like their body has turned turned off the mechanism. Still, you start trying to pull it out of the cell membranes, and it gets ah, back in the bloodstream, okay. and they start going up. And I'll usually get a little bit of relief with that. Is yeah, I think I'm on the right track here. I think my you know intuition and the diagnostic and the symptoms, you know, were right. And I'm actually sort of happy they're going up. Although eventually we want them to go back down again. Okay, well, that's that's really interesting, and I also believe TGF beta one and C four A can be suppressed by Marcon's, so that could possibly be another reason that someone could be a bit lower than their symptoms suggest. Yes, and I think um, one of the other SIRS doctors recently mentioned that she had found some research that there are certain SNPs associated with making TGF beta, and she had a patient who was homozygous and really had low TGF beta levels, even though they had SIRS. So there's more to all of this than we know now and may ever know. It's just, it's a very big field um, and a lot of things. So that's why you know, making the diagnosis really is based on the exposure to water damage buildings, the um, the labs and the symptoms, all of them, and a decline in health that's puzzling, too. So, um, it, there's there's an art to diagnosis and judgment calls that we're making a lot of the time. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Okay, a little bit about improve, starting to talk about sim, uh, treatment rather a little bit and how people can start feeling a bit better from some of the brain symptoms such as the brain fog and the anxiety. Um, one of the first steps after removing, removing uh, oneself from exposure to a water damage building is taking binders. Um, and uh, these are a certain class of medications or supplements which actually bind onto biotoxins from a water damage building. And um, the main one is cholestyramine, 
as most of you would know, which is often abbreviated as CSM. Um, and it's just wondering, Dr. Ackle, if you could talk a little bit about CSM and also on the right of this diagram, we've got charcoal and well coal pictured. And maybe just talking a, a little bit about how these um, medications and or supplements can make people get some improvement with their brain symptoms. You know, unfortunately, the only way we really have to get mycotoxins out of the body and get the inflammation down is using a binder. And people are sometimes surprised I don't have a magic pill or IV that's going to do this and it's over with. Um, it's a um, it's a long-term effort, especially since the fatty um, mem fat cells in the membranes have been storing these toxins, and if exposure's been going on a long time, the fat cells have essentially been protecting the person by packing them in there instead of the brain or the heart or other places where they do more damage. So, as we pull, as we bind to the bile with cholestyramine and prevent its enterohepatic reabsorption, which is a really important thing to understand, we start to rid the body of some toxins which enable the cells to release more toxins, and that's why detoxification takes time. Um, so, uh, of all of these, cholestyramine is the strongest binder, and if people, you know, essentially have pretty good guts and don't have a lot of GI symptoms, that's always my first choice. Unfortunately, people with guts that really work well are, are somewhat rare. And the next choice is going to be, um, and that would just be regular old Questrin. I don't like Prevolite. I don't like Aspartame. I don't think we need to add any more toxins into a body. Um, and so, I, I like compounded cholestyramine for a number of people because I think the constipation issues can be less, there's just less, ad, there, there are no additives. Usually I'll use the stuff that has nothing in it but cholestyramine and I see less problems with constipation, certainly a lot less problems with rash or um, allergic reactions and people seem to tolerate it on the whole better. And if I have a sense people are sensitive and react to other medications, I'm going to go with compounded cholestyramine, which in the long run uh, can be cheaper if it's efficient than um, trying other things that don't work. Well call is a great choice, especially when people work, because it's much easier to take these pills and you can take them with food and you can travel more easily with it. It's just weaker than cholestyramine, doesn't bind as much. On the other hand, when people are consistent with the treatment, we're going to get great responses. So if people are doing cholestyramine like once every other day, it's, it's not very efficacious. And that's because you have to block the enterohepatic reabsorption, where 90% of the uh, uh, substances in the bile are essentially re reabsorbed back into the body before they're finally excreted. And in that reabsorption, all we've done now is take um, toxins that may have been safely hidden away, brought them through the body, and are now pumping them back into the body so the rest of the immune system can start reacting. And it's not a great idea, and it may be one reason why people sometimes seem to get worse is they're being inconsistent. So I'd rather do like half a scoop of cholestyramine twice a day than a full packet once every other day. Um, and that's a really important point to remember. Um, so well call is a great choice. And then there are people who are just so sensitive or constipation such an issue that we start with charcoal and I always tell people, yes, I've seen people get better with charcoal over the years. I think it is effective. It doesn't work the same as cholestyramine or well call. It's not as strong. But in animal literature, there's a lot of literature that it does bind directly to the mycotoxins and appears to escort them out and people get better. So, And charcoal can be taken after meals. It helps with gas and bloating. You know, it's used by every ambulance in the U.S. for poisoning and toxicity. And for some people, it works very, very well. So the choice of binder depends an awful lot on the individual. And you have better responses, I think, if you sort of um, gauge how a person's going to uh, respond and start with the one they can best handle. 
Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for that, Dr. Ackley. So really, the use of binders is a very, very important step in the, the SERS treatment protocol, and it can make people's brains feel a lot better. And, and it's important also um, not to withhold this, even if you're not totally out of a water damage building. Uh, and that's an important little um, little bit of mythology we're wanting to bust as well, that you don't have to be totally... I mean, of course it's better. It is, it is preferable to be out, out of a water damage building, but you don't have to wait for that step to, to have occurred for you to start taking cholesteramine or another binder, and you can still get some benefits from doing so. So that's an important point. Uh, now, a little bit about Marcons, uh, which stands for multiply antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staph. Um, now, we all know staph is a very, very common bug, and it's associated with skin infections and, and bone and joint infections and things like that. However, in SERS, there's a different type of staph that we look at um, called Marcons, which uh, gets in the nasal cavities. And, and there's a number of things we use for that, and we know that Marcons can have a direct effect on the brain. So I was just wondering if you could talk uh, a little bit about how um, treating Marcons can also help people um, feel better in terms of their brain symptoms, um, correctly. Well, um, we hypothesize, and there's some evidence now with Joe Musto's lab, that um, the biofilms which um, are holding the Marcons, the Marcons themselves are making a, a toxin that's really quite toxic, neurotoxic. And again, given the proximity of the colonization of the nasopharynx, the, the jaw bones and the nose itself, uh, the sinuses with the brain, it's not too surprising to hear that Marcon's um, probably does affect the brain and uh, the impact of a neurotoxic substance coming from those may be why some people routinely say when we finally get rid of Marcon's, wow, that's made a big difference. I am a lot less anxious. That really feels good. I just feel so much better. And I've seen that enough over the years consistently to know that that's not a step I really want to ever skip. And it's worth persisting, going to the dentist, looking for cavitations, going through different sprays, knowing that we will eventually, with dental treatment, I'm going to tell you, as well as nasal treatments, get rid of Marcon's. And it's worth it, especially if you're, again, thinking, what is the effect of some neurotoxic substance on my brain as I'm getting older, et cetera. Um, I think Bredesen has said there's definitely an association between poor dental health and Alzheimer's. Great. Yeah. So Marcon's, treating Marcon's is, is a really, really um, important other step of the, uh, the SERS treatment protocol. And here is the full SERS treatment protocol, which we also call the Shoemaker protocol. Uh, so we've talked about removal from water damaged buildings. We've talked about binding toxins with binders. We've talked about eliminating Marcon's. There are a whole bunch of other steps in the middle there in light blue, which we call hormonal and immune correction. We're not going to talk too much about them today. That includes things like DDAVP nasal spray and, and using um, either Actos or high-dose fish oil along with a low amylose diet. And uh, low sartan is a medication that's used to, to, to reduce TGF beta levels. Um, but the, the cherry on top of the SERS treatment protocol is VIP nasal spray. Um, thanks, Caleb. Off. Oh. Oh, you didn't have another. Okay, so, no, no, so no. Jump, jumping onto the VIP nasal spray, um, and I think the, the research that Dr. Shoemaker presented in Irvine um, last year was very exciting, actually, in terms of the amount of reversal of um, brain shrinkage that one could achieve with, um, with VIP nasal spray, and it seems that really um, this is an extremely important step for, for reversing some of the brain changes of SERS. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that, Dr. Ackerley, and how you think this is beneficial in terms of people's uh, brain and neurological symptoms? Um, absolutely. I think, you know, um, I try and get people to understand BIP usually comes at the end of treatment. Um, sometimes there are exceptions but that it is worth hanging on for because uh, when you start it, for many people, they will say that is the most significant thing they've done. They're starting to, again, feel normal. 
One is its effect on the lungs and the ability to um, relax smooth muscle, to take a deep breath again, to get more oxygen back in the body. It can help POTS in that way. Those are all very, very big deals. It's this research on the brain that I get very excited about. It's been linked to, you know, dissolving plot, linked with, you know, helping memory. Um, it's been researched for Alzheimer's. And I've had a number of patients over the years who say their first spray of VIP, they got the euphoria, but it stayed. And they've been depressed for a long time. And they finally started to feel again pleasure euphoria and that does happen and the depression hasn't come back and I'm not saying that happens for everybody it's unique but it's happened for enough people that yeah that one's worth it for others it's um, a slower haul they may get more of a dysphoria in the beginning and I've worked with a number of people where we just started a very low dose like one tenth dose and work with um, uh, getting a person to be able to increase um, a t ability to tolerate the detoxification. We, we think VIP is what's helping uh, release or, or move some of that extra fluid from the brain back into the CSF and out of the body. So it's helping the edema. And sometimes that can be irritating before the brain starts working again. But it's worth sticking with. For others, it's a combination of having more energy and improved cognitive function as well as perhaps even tolerating some exposure a little bit better that um, makes it where you can begin to think maybe I'm going to return to full health. So lots of things about VIP and I think there's a lot more exciting news to eventually come from studying what VIP is doing in the brain um, at the genomic level as well as the neurological psychiatric level. Okay, great. So it sounds like there's a lot of potential for uh, improvement through the Shoemaker Protocol. I'm just going to change my uh, microphone here again. Um, I'm encountering this project. Okay. Um, so it sounds like that, that a lot of people can get really good improvement with their brain symptoms through all of these steps of, of the Shoemaker Protocol. And that, that's really encouraging. For people because it can be quite scary I think it's worth noting that at the start um, of having SIRS just the amount of um, memory loss and, and um, impairment to clear thinking that occurs but perhaps just knowing that there is a stepwise treatment protocol and that the brain changes can be reversed is somewhat calming for people I guess Dr. Ackley would you say? It is and then learning to identify re-exposure by some of the very quick reoccurrence of these symptoms. I've talked before about how people can walk into water damaged buildings and really very quickly start to feel suicidal and they were feeling fine beforehand and learning to walk out and have it stopped and every time I tell it to a new patient it's like yeah right you know and as they get better and then suicidal thoughts reoccur and um, they will begin to realize wow these things I consider meaningful. The fact that I want to, you know, hurt myself in some way. It's coming from a chemistry. It's coming from inflammation. It's mold. I call it black mold, black thoughts. That's, that's what happens. And, you know, and, and it can reverse as quickly as turning around and getting out of the building, maybe wiping off your nose, taking a swig of cholestyramine, going home and showering, things like that. And nobody believes it till it happens to them. And they go, oh my God, you know? So um, that, that's a light bulb for a lot of people that their thoughts and feelings they consider real are based on black mold, black thoughts. And so um, that's, that's a big deal, and that's where Brain on Fire has been helpful to a lot of people to just realize this isn't you. You don't have to act on this stuff, and you can get better, like turning around and just looking up at the shower and realizing, oh, my God, there's black mold right on top of me as I'm sitting here thinking about you know ways to kill myself. Um, so, and, and that's being frank. So that's important to know that that can reverse and stay reversed and can then be used as a warning sign. For some people, it's not as dramatic. It's irritability, anger, 
things are happy, you're getting along with your spouse, you walk into a building and all of a sudden every rotten thing they've done is just right there at the tip of your tongue. Think about it for a second um, and and realize, wow, we're at each other's throats, what happened? And, and walk out and you can find that you can find the pleasure back in life again. These things are real. And, and I suspect they happen to a lot more people than people who are treating for SIRS, is that the irritability and arguments we see going on um, maybe, you know, do as much to, you know, presence of environmental inflammagens as they are to the reality that there's an endless war of the sexes, et cetera. So um, I think that's optimistic to know this. So other things we can do, certainly diet. I like anything that's basically going to be low carb, paleo, below 50 grams of carbs when I'm asked, anti-inflammatory. I don't like gluten. I don't like dairy for most people. Um, but I, you know, try and work where people are, but just realize that in my experience and most people's experience, those are the two of the most common allergens and inflammagens, and it, they are making things worse in the brain. Um, so the diet alone, the anti-inflammatory diet, if you're going to go on some sort of treatment for Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, um, it's going to be a very low carb diet and lots of aerobic exercise are the mainstays really of the medicine protocol. Um, and it's the same thing for SIRS, I believe, that um, getting rid of the inflammatory components of your diet can't be overstated how important that is and important for your long, lifelong brain health. Um, so it's a big deal. Fish oil. I really like fish oil. There's so much research on fish oil in psychiatry, how incredibly useful it is for inflammation. Um, and inflammation, by the way, turns out to be a very strong factor, if not maybe the only factor in every psychiatric illness that's studied. So when we're asking what causes this stuff, inflammation plays a major role. And you'd hear more about it if the drug companies had better anti-inflammatory medicines um, for the brain. Um, and in fact, they've kind of given up developing really new um, antidepressants because they know that anything they do is only going to get about 50% of people better if it's along the neurotransmitter route. So things you can do without drug companies really are fish oil, curcumin, NAC, all of them very well researched at this point in psychiatry and in neurology as the supplements probably most linked with helping inflammation. Um, magnesium, uh, hopefully um, that's on everybody's list and is getting measured and treated because it's such a common nutrient deficiency and treating that helps anxiety pretty quickly as well as blood pressure. Probiotics, vitamin D to me, that's kind of normal. You know, there are very few people who don't need, um, need those. So, um, and the other things that I think are important are um, counseling and therapy can always be useful as long as the person you're working with accepts that you're not psychosomatic and that mold illness um, or Lyme or um, that neuroinflammation is real. If they're kind of undermining everything said that, you know, nodding and winking, move on. You can find, definitely find people I certainly know people and do others who are psychologists, have had mold themselves, and are very happy to work with other mold patients. Um, so, and very helpful in many aspects of all of this. Um, relaxation, yoga, eudaimonic happiness, these things have all been shown to decrease inflammation at the genetic level and turning off the inflammatory epigenetic, infl um, at the epigenetic level is going to work far more, far better, I should say, far better than just working snip by snip to try and correct each snip. As you can turn off the whole epigenetics with inflammation, you're going to get a lot more done. Um, and then I, I do mention limbic retraining and a lot more these days to people. Uh, it's called dynamic neural retraining. Um, it's a course that's easily available on DVD. And it is for training that amygdala, it's for training the um, limbic over-responsiveness that many people start to develop somewhere along the line, either in this illness or for other reasons. They're in what we call sympathetic overdrive and everything has become a, a fight or flight situation and relaxation, which is where healing takes place with vagal tone, 
is very hard to achieve. And I think it can be summed up is, you know, when your mind is not your best friend, you're really in trouble. And the mind is a very powerful part of healing. And when it can be your best friend and coach you and encourage you, it's terrific. But when it's gone into um, hyper fear mode and it's seeing, you know, fearful situations and everything new, um, it's an overdrive and it's really your worst enemy at that point. And I've had uh, one physician say, who's a surge physician saying, I think it's better than cholestyramine. For some people, it's going to be the only way really we even get them to cholestyramine is to start turning off the fear response to everything new. And this does seem to really work. Um, and I've seen it work now dramatically in a couple of people who stick through it. Um, and well worth investigating if you turn around and say, you know, my mind really is my worst enemy. <laughs> and if there's something I can do about it, terrific. Um, so I think the one other point I want to make as we close is that um, I am very passionate about getting other psychiatrists, psychologists, neurologists to recognize family practitioners how important inflammation is and what they're labeling depression and anxiety. Um, depression and anxiety, it's about 25% of the population that's said to have mental illness, a word I hate. Um, and, you know, that's about the same percentage we say is influenced by mold. It's an interesting coincidence. But we don't have that really effective treatments for depression. By 2030, who says it's going to be the leading cause of disability worldwide? Obviously, if antidepressants did what their name said, it would not be the leading cause of disability. But psychiatry um, has made no progress really in the last 30 years in actually reducing the amount of illness, of psychiatric illness in the world, while we've made big strides in infectious diseases, cardiovascular cancer, things like that. So learning about the causes of inflammation and learning that mold is a very common cause of neuroinflammation is really important to me. And, um, you know, anyone else you can educate about it or just learn it yourself and start to you know treat your own depression and anxiety is is a big deal and alzheimer's you know that is becoming an epidemic people will use the words epidemic as more and more boomers are reaching social security and that's a pretty fearful thing and if there's something you can do to prevent it by fixing the roof fix the roof it's worth it <laughs> you know Okay, do have, so... Do you have time for some questions? Yes, directly? of course, yes. Okay. okay. Um, there's some good questions, as always, from this community. Um, this is one from Dana. Wondering how we can distinguish between autoimmune encephalitis and mold illness. Um, that's a really good question. Um, autoimmune encephalitis is pretty rare and actually somewhat hard um, to diagnose, even if you might suspect it. I know it's gotten a lot of play in books, but it's much, much rarer than just mold illness. And as you know, mold is also what um, can certainly contribute to um, turning on the whole autoimmune response. So in terms of symptoms, don't really know. Laboratory testing, um, is is where you have to go for that and also oddness of symptoms so hallucinations are relatively rare in mold illness they do occur but if someone's having you know unusual um, musical um, auditory uh, hallucinations in the absence of other things I, i'd be thinking perhaps more autoimmune or hallucinations just really coming up out of nowhere but again it's going to be called schizophrenia or bipolar pretty fast. Um, and you're looking for things like sed rate. There, there are things you can look for in autoimmune. So even knowing about either one of them would be welcome in the world of psychiatry in an emergency room where people are seeing them. Okay. And there's another question. Um, if one finds patterns of mold and Lyme in the neuroquant, when specifically is Lyme treated in the protocol? Um, after avoidance, after binders, after Marcon, or after VIP, or somewhere in the middle? 
That's a really good question and probably depends on the physician and the patient. I think acute Lyme, if you find it, should be treated right away. I mean, if you have a chance to actually prevent it from developing into chronic Lyme, by all means, treat it right away. If we're talking chronic post-Lyme, I often recommend patients get out of exposure and start treating for mold and see in the protocol, are they getting any better? Are things developing? And for so many people, they start to get a lot better and the idea of post-Lyme kind of fades in the background. It doesn't happen for everybody. At some point it becomes obvious the joint pain is not going away um, and we're gonna treat Lyme or test for it um, more robustly than the usual screening tests we use. So I think that's pretty individual, but um, getting out of mold exposure if you're undergoing Lyme treatment is a big deal, is, is going to make the, uh, things uh, much easier. Okay. Could Dr. Ackley please comment on the increased size of the cerebellum and any effects this may have on the ability of the brain to cope with the SERS protocol? Um, what I say and what I've talked about um, is that more commonly that large cerebellum, which is at the back of the brain, and is going to, we presume, um, decrease the ability of the CSF to flow easily out of the brain, does contribute to making VIP in particular harder to tolerate, and may actually even make binders harder to tolerate, again, because we're going to be pulling toxins. So when I have hypermobile people and I get neuroquamps pretty early in treatment and I see the cerebellum's really big, we'll talk about it. I actually love craniosacral treatment and lymphatic drainage as a treatment, which is A, not going to hurt anybody because it's pretty pleasurable, and for many people becomes almost life-saving because it helps vagal tone tremendously. That's documented. Uh, if you find someone who's pretty good at it, especially DOs who are really good, it starts to readjust the face. I wish I had with me. Someone just showed me with a large cerebellum, someone actually in treatment for Lyme far longer than they should have been who started to get better when mold was mentioned, who found a DO. She showed me her face from last year was kind of fault swollen with the mold faces. And she's been getting treatment for three months and her face now looks like she had a facelift. There's no swelling, the cheeks look good. It's like, wow, that's just from craniosacral or DO. And she's getting a lot of relief from headaches um, and brain fog from that. So I, I like to mention that that's a way that there seem to be treatments that help increase that drainage um, that can be done independent of the protocol. And for patients who, we're really having a hard time getting detoxification started. I just like what I call manual drainage, which is going to be cranial sacral, lymphatic, um, colonics, things like that, that just open the lymphatics, open um, uh, detoxification of the gut, and can help a patient begin to tolerate some detoxification. If everything's clogged and you start now demanding the body detoxify more, it doesn't work very well. Okay. I believe you mentioned CBD oil at the um, Irvine conference, Dr. Yeah. Adley. Is that something you think you still feel that that's a useful strategy for people with yeah. cerebellum flowing? Yeah, and for others too, but certainly with large cerebellums, it has evidently a lot of ca um, cannabinoid receptors. And I really see bad reactions to it. People sometimes say it's not doing much, but others just even a few drops, and these are the people a few drops of anything makes worse, are like, wow, I'm sleeping a little better. My pain is better. And not, not really negative stuff, anxiety. So I think it's absolutely helpful, and it's fairly easy in a number of states. Uh, it's, it's legal in every state, but in some states it's, it's even easier to get, and it's, it's certainly worth trying. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, I had a very quick one, Caleb, if you don't mind me jumping in here, which I think is a very important thing to mention. Pyrrole disorder. Do you, how important do you think it is for people to um, look into and be diagnosed with pyrrole disorder if they're suffering from anxiety and depression uh, and, and mold illness? I test everybody for zinc and sometimes copper, but always for magnesium and zinc. 
and um, I make an estimate when people zinc are below 1,000, I get them at 700, 800 red blood cell zinc is, you know, we're probably looking at KPU, especially when I start giving zinc and it's not going anywhere. So I think it's obviously important. It's a long term, it's, it's not a fast thing to correct. And again, a lot of, um, I think Klinghart, who knows the most about it probably has said it's, you know, a product of chronic Lyme, chronic mold, chronic infections, and so we're treating all of it, but I am always using treatments for KPU if I think it's present. Yeah, so, so just to explain for those who are not aware of what KPU or cryptopyroluria is, it's a condition that was described by Abraham Hoffer in the 1960s. There's a certain substance which we call urinary pyrol, which is created in the blood of people who are unwell, and we don't know why people create this substance, but it's created in the, in the, in the process of red blood cell um, production. And importantly, it causes people to excrete more zinc and vitamin B6 in the urine. And, and there's also some other nutrients such as biotin. And as a result of that, what happens is people tend to get an excess of copper, and, and that tends to increase um, adrenaline and noradrenaline which can increase anxiety and the, the low zinc and, and vitamin b6 can lower serotonin so in my practice i found that to be an extremely important cause of of anxiety and depression problems so i thought that was an important one to mention as part of this call if you're going to bring up abraham hoffer i'll make one point too is is he was i think one of the first to actually um, popularize histamine along with KPU as a major cause of psychiatric illness. And unfortunately, he was pretty well laughed at, including by someone like me who was trained in an institution that loved to make fun of the histamine theories. Well, it's actually turned out that histamine is a major player um, in neuropsychiatric um, symptoms. Uh, certainly anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, as well as uh, brain fog, as well as probably contributing to all the neurodegenerative sorts of things we see. So um, the relationship of histamine and SIRS appears to be there. Um, and water damaged buildings certainly do seem to destabilize mast cells with the innate immune system. Um, and Turning off exposure probably helps what we're calling mast cell now, but I will say that I've become more and more to appreciate that histamine is a major player in what we call reactivity. In this protocol, there are people who react to everything, and VIP is not working, you know, things aren't working, is that starting to look at mast cells and treatment is, um, can be quite successful. And I like to do that in working with allergists locally who also look at that. And I'm very lucky in Tucson, we have a geneticist who was really good and taught me a lot about Ehlers-Danlos type three, which is certainly more common in the people I see and more common in the SERS population. Um, and someone who, you know, also works with mast cell syndrome, not the disorder, which is different. And, and it's learning those things and learning about POTS that I think start to get a little bit deeper into this whole protocol of what people need to do to calm down what we're simply calling anxiety and depression. But histamine is a very big player in, in neuropsychiatric symptoms based on research, not just based on me saying so, but just based on actual research is it does bad things to the whole microglial system. There's a few people asking about low dose naltrexin and the SERS protocol. Uh, it's certainly um, fine. I use it a whenever anybody asks me or when they actually have autoimmune illness or when I see that, hey, maybe the depression which is sort of low grade, might be helped with it. It helps insomnia, it helps pain, um, it helps certainly um, autoimmune issues. And I have a couple of patients diagnosed MS in whom low dose naltrexone, they could tell major league when they started that it was helping their symptoms. So I, there's really very little drawback associated with trying it and you can also take it in the morning if it's keeping you up that's the whole idea of only taking it at night seems to have been debunked and absolutely worth trying it's inexpensive and a go um, low amount of side effects more questions Caleb or did you want us to yes. talk about the course uh, maybe one or two more questions okay. um, 
Does VIP correct the neuropsychological issues unique to SIRS, or do the sleep issues, anxiety, depression, etc., require independent treatment? You know, that's one of those questions that's probably best answered on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, sleep's incredibly important, and that's something that I will work on in the protocol, independent of where people are. If they're really not sleeping, there are hormonal things we can do, or sometimes medications that will make a big difference um, in sleep, and getting sleep is really important. Um, what were the other ones besides sleep, the neuropsychiatric stuff? Um, you know, there's a whole contingent of people who are kind of depressed and anxious when you ask them, but they're, they're kind of quiet about it. They're not making a big deal about it. You go along in the protocol, and all of a sudden you notice one day they're coming in, they're kind of smiling, they crack a joke, and it's like, hello, are you feeling better? And yeah, so we haven't really labeled them depressed or anxious, but they've had those symptoms, we'll acknowledge them, and they're getting better without really treatment or focusing on them. And that happens for a lot of people. Um, if depression or anxiety is... Um, basically the overriding symptom, depending on the severity of the depression, I am still going to offer antidepressants. They do work in some people and it's worth trying, especially if someone is seriously depressed and we're talking about hospitalization, which has had to happen for a couple of people at points. Um, and benzodiazepines, I think, you know, I don't like the dependency aspects and there are supplements that can really help increase GABA. But um, I'm not shy about using them in people who are having severe anxiety again, which is interfering with treatment, interfering um, with sleep, and seems that getting that rest or uh, getting GABA better under control is really helpful. And so I, I think there's a real role. And I don't have people having very many bad reactions to benzodiazepines. When they need them, they work, as opposed to antidepressants and other psych meds, which tend to make things worse a lot. Yeah. So again, it's, it's individual depending on the severity, depending on how well people tolerate things as they're able to get better. Um, the whole Ehlers-Danlos, POTS, sympathetic overdrive, those are the people who may benefit the most from anything we can do to calm down the pulse rate and calm down sympathetic activation. And have you used Epsom salts baths as just a little additional thing people can do to... Always recommend it. There is no contraindication and even people who feel that they have SNPs that don't tolerate sulfur often do fine. There's magnesium and sulfur, they're both needed, and taking a warm bath before bed instead of watching a computer TV or fighting with somebody is really a good idea. <laughs> so, yeah, so no, that's, that's, that's like automatic, it's absolutely, go for the Epsom salts, Dead Sea salts have a few more trace minerals in them, is, you know, don't, don't hold back. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ackley. So, Caleb, shall we go into the course and just very quickly yep. to go into the course? We're probably doc taking up a lot of Dr. Ackley's time here. So, so I just wanted to, f to close by just explaining a little bit about my course. And, you know, this is a tiny bit commercial, but I, I really, really do believe this helps people. And um, I believe it's very important because I think it's, it's vital to understand the illness that you're suffering from and to gain clarity and confidence and this condition is extremely complex or it can be made extremely complex um, and I created an eight-week online course to to help people as much as anything just to feel less anxiety around the condition and less despair around whether they could get better and I see that in a lot of patients you probably do as well Dr. Ackley um, so much, yes, yeah, so much so that let me finish the commercial for you is I recommended to our local Tucson group that they start using it. In fact, the leaders um, bought your course and they're studying it one, you know, one module a month. And I'm finding it helpful that um, I'm getting more uh, questions, a little more fact-based from some people. There's sometimes a tendency of people, again, to have problems, you know, figuring out who that they're reading knows what they're talking about and who doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, and your course is just really helpful. And hey, here's what we know. 
this is the facts of the protocol, this is what the protocol is, this is why we're doing it, this is what we expect. Just even the simple question that's coming around a lot recently, I can't take cholesterol until I get out of a water damaged building. Well, if, if that were part of the protocol, we wouldn't be treating 50% of people for the first year or maybe two because it's that hard to get out of water exposure for some people. So no, totally false. And one of those things that really would hinder anybody who believes that from, from getting better. So having some factual based resources is real important. And I, you know, as I say, uh, the group here is doing it. They like it. People are wanting to attend more to, to listen to it. So um, that's my recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ackley. And I think there is a little bit of a risk just using the um, online support groups such as on Facebook, even though um, there are some excellent people like Caleb on there who are giving good information. Of course, there's, there's all sorts of people who are chiming in there and um, the quality of information is variable. In this course, I believe the quality of information is excellent and you can rely upon the information. Um, we talk about how to screen and diagnose SIRS. Uh, we talk about the Shoemaker Protocol in depth, what the steps are, what are the medications, how to tell if a building is a water damage building. And, and these are big questions because remediation is a big deal. And you really, the decision making around that can actually be very expensive if you make mistakes in that area. And, um, and therefore, I believe that's probably one of the most important areas also to make sure you get a good remediator if you're remediating your building because not every remediator is going to be at, as, um, at the standard that you require to recover from SIRS and if you just get that one point out of it, I guarantee that the course is worth it yeah, um, just for that one little thing. Um, delving into each biomarker, we talk about C4A, we talk about TGF beta, we talk about MMP9 and uh, we talk about the normal ranges, which laboratories should you do what they do in the body. Again, we can, you know, we help you through this process of the of deciphering the alphabet soup. Um, where to send patients if you yourself do not have a Shoemaker certified physician? Um, we help you to navigate which ones, um, also which ones have special expertise areas. So Dr. Ackley is a psychiatrist. Dr. McMahon is a, a pediatrician. Um, so we do, we are grow, getting a growing number of specialists who actually have special interest areas. We have certain of the, the Shoemaker certified physicians who have an interest in Lyme disease. And uh, in the course, we go into that a little bit more that then you'll find on the, um, the website of Surviving Mold. Um, we talk a little bit about building remediation, including the do-it-yourself remediation and the science on that. Um, we talk about other sources of biotoxin exposure, such as Lyme, Babesia, Cigatera, and algae. We talk about the Lyme controversy, and I'm not going to lie and say that that's a simple thing to navigate. It's, it's not. It's, it's quite complicated and confusing, and I believe the course makes it as simple as possible. And to really just understand why there's such a big difference between the ILADS and the IDSA um, perspectives and, and how to understand the difference on Lyme disease. Uh, so there's a website at moldillnessmadesimple.com which you can check out but once you sign up you get access to all of the materials which includes uh, 18 video lectures and slides, a workbook for each chapter, uh, weekly quizzes, exclusive uh, webinar archives. So for instance, the previous w uh, webinars, such as the one we did with Dr. Sonia Rappaport and with Dr. Samantha Clark and so on, they're all on there and you can access them. And we also have a private Facebook group where people ask questions and I go on there regularly, Caleb's on there regularly, um, other people who are very, very experienced in this area are um, answering questions. And uh, there's also some, there's a degree of peer support on there, which is rather nice actually. Uh, so you can see these are an example. Sorry, just uh, go back to that slide for just a, a moment, Caleb. Yeah, just so you can see that's an example on the left-hand side of this uh, uh, slide of what the uh, PowerPoint slides uh, 
um, are like. So for instance, the concept of cytokines is quite confusing and it's quite hard to get your head around, but we make it as simple as possible by explaining that they are chemical messengers or proteins used by immune cells to communicate with each other. So as you can see, we make these basic concepts understandable. And if you can get the key basic concepts, you can understand this illness. Thanks, Carol. Uh, we do have a discount code for this webinar for people who have come along to this webinar and uh, it's Brain on Fire, <laughs> which is named after Dr. Ackley's article. Um, and, um, and so the course is 149.25 for the next uh, 48 hours. Look, I really do believe it's worth it. Um, it's a very complicated illness. If you can understand it, and if you can gain a level of confidence over it and, um, and, and understand the steps you're going to need to take, it's much more likely you're going to hang in there and not drop out of the process and, and get yourself well. And, and that's my passion. It really is. I really don't like seeing people who get overwhelmed and, and depressed and get stuck there through this illness. Um, I've recovered from it myself. I'm not sure if you're aware, um, Dr. Ackley, that I actually I had it myself. And, um, and recovered. Well, that's a great example is yes, people recover every day from it and, um, and go on with their lives. Yeah, and don't identify as mold survivors particularly, but just try and help others identify and recover too. That's quite possible. I was going to say if, you know, people learn this in death, I'm hoping they might even get interested in research themselves at some point or real, you know, real research or going on careers or getting involved professionally because it's that kind of awareness coming from the ground up which is happening that's beginning to turn the academic establishment um, to have to pay attention to this very common and sometimes very devastating illness. So, um, that would That's be right. my wish. That's right, and and I just want to fit, I want to just close by saying a few things from from the heart. That if you if you can get through this illness and and get to the other side, um, there are really good things on the other side. I believe this can be an amazing growth journey for you, for you personally as individuals. I know that sounds um, difficult to stomach if you're right in the middle of this at the moment, um, but. I, I definitely believe that and I believe that there are really good things on the other side in terms of you being able to then jump into another life purpose or, or your own a deeper level of life purpose if you like and I've seen that happen in a number of, of individuals and um, and I believe it can happen for you. Um, Dr. Ackley anything you'd like to close with? No, just thank you. I've seen the same thing. I have a few patients who've become real advocates at different levels, more pediatric or adolescents, of getting doctors and professionals to pay attention to the fact that not every adolescent who's suicidal is just needs more antidepressants, but you know, can may have mold, may have Lyme, may have Babesia, Bartonella, is that the more awareness that's brought that these things are real and really do cause illness first seen in adolescence, usually in the neuropsychiatric realms and not in the rest of the physical realm, is gonna help save a few more lives from like endless, you know, bouts of depression, maybe actually committing suicide. That's you know, that's an enormous big deal is if you can do that for others right, thank well thank you dr gupta and dr akili for your time today and thank you for everyone who joined us um a replay will be available and um, that'll be going out through the mailing list and facebook groups but uh thank you again Great, and I also just wanted to very quickly express my gratitude uh, for Dr. Ackley's contribution to this field, um, including the um, her research she's done on VIP and NeuroQuant and, and Marcons, and I think it's making a real difference for this whole field to move forward and for us to help patients. So thank you for being on today. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you, and happy Memorial Day for everyone in the U.S. <laughs> All right, great. Have, have a great day. Okay. Everyone, thank you. Bye. Bye.